Okay, good morning. Good morning. I know it's a cloudy and, and rainy day, so I appreciate everyone showing up this morning. I uh, welcome our guests from Mountain State Health Alliance, and I am very, very pleased to welcome to campus this morning Mr. Brian uh, Nass. We are very fortunate. Uh, to have him with us uh, this morning uh, to discuss uh, lean in uh, health care. Um, Mr. Ness has had a very interesting you know, career uh, path, and as I was just mentioning to him, uh, his career path you know, does illustrate how universal the principles of process and quality improvement are and how applicable they are to different uh, settings. So he started his professional journey at Iowa State University. Uh, Olivia here is one of our students, <laughs> graduates is from Iowa, uh, where, where he uh, completed his bachelor's in electrical engineering, and then to Stanford University, where my daughter is dreaming ah. about going in a couple of years, um, only because she was in California, <laughs> where he completed his master's in electrical and uh, mechanical engineering. Uh, then he started you know, his career with uh, IBM, and over a period of uh, 17 years, he worked both in the U.S. and internationally on uh, software and hardware development and design, as well as on marketing and strategic planning for the IBM uh, corporation. Uh, I guess after that, his entrepreneurial spirit kicked in, and uh, he decided to venture and start his own uh, software uh, company, uh, which he did, you know, very uh, successfully. But it was not long before the Mayo Clinic uh, recognized you know, his talents and skills and recruited him to head their for-profit uh, operations, and then after that uh, to become the lead. Uh, over their quality, safety, and service uh, initiatives. Uh, his success, I guess, at uh, Mayo Clinic did not go unnoticed, and so Mission Health Systems uh, here in Asheville, North Carolina, recruited him to move down to, to Asheville and to create the Mayo Clinic model of process improvement uh, at Mission uh, Healthcare. About two years ago, uh, he joined a Simpler Consulting, uh, which is a national firm that specializes in lean transformations and has been working uh, through Simpler uh, on process improvement initiatives with healthcare systems across the nation, including with Mountain States uh, Health Alliance. And again, it's very interesting that Simpler um, has clients, you know, ranging from PepsiCo, Gillette, and Duracell, to the military, to healthcare systems of, of different uh, sizes. So as you can see, really a wealth of experience uh, that he is here today to share with us. Um, thank you again for your time. We know you keep a very busy schedule, and I want especially to thank my colleague uh, Jenny Hunt for inviting Mr. Nass and arranging this presentation. So we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. I'm impressed that you remember all those details without any notes. Um, I was in Switzerland once, and I um, had written a bio for myself just for fun, because I figured it would never be actually used. And it said, raised by a pack of wolves, mm -hmm. ran away to join the circus at age five, and a whole bunch of other things. And the Swiss person was very proper and went through every line and, uh, in, and, and actually had two languages going at the same time. And I thought, okay, never again will I, I make up anything that's not true. So anyway, I bet people wondered, what on earth was that about? Um, so I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I'm going to go over um, a little bit of lean today. Lean is a topic that could easily take semesters to cover. And I think too often we focus on a tool and, and we just talk about a tool or a set of tools. I really want to talk about it more as a philosophy, as a cultural change mechanism. And uh, knowing that you're getting into leadership positions, I want to give you sort of the leadership perspective of that because leadership is so crucial to making this happen. So we'll go through this, and we'll do a couple of exercises in the middle, um, and I want to make sure that I leave time 
for not only questions, but to go over some specifics from healthcare in any realm you're interested in, from surgery to acute care to critical care to uh, outpatient clinical uh, settings, etc., to make sure that you can see that this is applied just pretty much every in every corner of, uh, of healthcare these days. I'm used to roaming, so I'll try to not walk all over the place here and get in front of the screen. Um, uh, what, Brian, oh, yes. It's certainly okay. To okay. Do that. All right. Yeah, no, this, I mean, this is very flexible, so feel okay. free to, to walk all right. around. All right, I'll, I'll probably end up doing that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, first of all, lean is a term that was coined by some researchers at MIT in 1990. It's not something that, uh, you know, the world uh, knew about before then. They knew about it probably through a set of different lenses before this. But the researchers at MIT were actually not writing a book about lean at all. They were writing a book about uh, uh, car manufacturing. And they were intending to look at differences in manufacturing techniques across all of the continents. And they started with Europe. They went to the United States. Then they got to Japan. And within Japan, they, they got to talking about Toyota. And they just stopped right there. And they wrote the book called The Machine That Changed the World, which is an interesting re read. Uh, but in that book, they coined the term lean. So you may be wondering, you know, where does this term come from? And what they were noticing, they just stopped their research at that point, And they said, we want to research that. We want to research whatever this is going on at Toyota because they've got double the quality. They've got half the cost. Uh, they've got half the time to market. And the people that work there are doubly satisfied with, with what's going on. So there's something about that. And that's where lean came from. And it's kind of an unfortunate term because it tends to be have this connotation of we're going to find a way to take out half the people and we'll all work harder, those of us that remain. And we're going to be very lean and mean. And it's, it's unfortunate. So, uh, But just so you know, it's a strategy. Lean is not a tool. Um, it's a strategy that really focuses on waste, variation, and also imbalance in processes. So at its core, it's really a business strategy that applies to basically any business that you can be in, from not-for-profits to for-profits, healthcare to, you know, any other industry. And what we're looking at is um, we're going to look at our processes from the standpoint of the people that we serve, which freaks people out because we're used to looking at processes through our own eyes because we design those processes and we hold them dear and we work in these processes. So that's one of the things that the researchers found out right away is one of the secrets to this is, um, wow, you're doing this from the point of view of your customer. That's really bizarre. So let's get into this a little bit. And by the way, Lean is a set of uh, tools and a strategy that I've run across, run across many. Uh, I used to be uh, heavily into Six Sigma, came out of engineering school with a set of tools. So I've been tackling problem solving and process improvement forever. But lean is distinctive to me, and uh, I've carried it with me in everything I've done since then, since the first time I ran across it, which was over in Japan, IBM Japan, when they said, instead of designing computers, Brian, we want you to go stand and watch cars being built, which I didn't really fully understand. This is back in the early 1980s, and they drew a circle around, uh, just a circle in the corner and said, stand there today and uh, watch. And I didn't understand what was going on. At the end of the day, they grilled me on, what did you learn? What did you see? And I didn't pass the test. So they said, tomorrow, you get to stand in the circle again. And this has become known as the Ono circle, which is see. You've got to see through different eyes. You've got to understand what's going on from the perspective of the customer. So I've, I've kind of reflected back over the years, why is it so powerful? What makes it different? And one of the reasons it's different is Everything that we do is an end-to-end -end perspective. Um, some of what you're going to run into, whatever institutions you happen to join, and maybe in your past work experience you've seen this as well, we tend to firefight. We tend to have a problem, and we jump on what we think is the solution, and we do something. We make a change, but it's very local. And we don't ever think about what's the impact downstream in a process, Maybe what's the impact to the people we're serving, etc. And lean by its definition, the, the tool sets uh, really force you to take that end-to-end -end perspective. And it's usually from the time that um, a request is made of your institution, your service line, to the time that that is fulfilled. And so we look at that an entire stream versus the islands of suboptimization, which most people do if they're not following uh, lean methodology. 
The other thing I've mentioned already is the customer perspective in, in healthcare. It's the patient perspective or the family perspective. That's quite different. Uh, no other uh, uh, process improvement methodology really focuses as much on the customer. Uh, normally, we optimize for ourselves. What hours make sense for us to work? When should our office be open? Um, an example of this is uh, in another place that I work, different state. Uh, we had 51 uh, outpatient clinics, primary care, urgent care centers, etc., and they're wondering why their market share was in decline over the past several years. And uh, one of the first questions I asked is, uh, when are you open? And I found out they were open from 9 to 4, and they're closed over lunchtime. Well, for most people that work, you know, that's not terribly attractive. And how did you arrive at that? Well, that's when we wanted to work. And so from a customer perspective, we kind of redid all of that. And, of course, that, that turned that back around. But we have to think about the people we're serving, what are their needs, uh, what do they need in terms of access, quality, even the services that we offer, etc. The third one is important, too. This, when, you're doing, when you're doing lean, when you're becoming lean, uh, you're doing this through direct observation. This is not a conference room exercise. Uh, we want to be out actually in the workplace observing what's really going on. We're not relying on what somebody has written down that says this is what our process is. Uh, we're not relying on data that may be uh, bogus. Uh, we're actually looking for ourselves, going and seeing. And we're going to practice this in a little bit in an exercise. Um, the other thing that is different about it is um, you get simultaneous improvement. Um, back when I was going to engineering school a thousand years ago, we had the notion that you can optimize for quality, or you can optimize for cost, or you can optimize for speed, and pick one, or pick a couple, but you're going to sub-optimize something else. And what we find here, as the researchers found with, in, in doing their work with Toyota, uh, it's simultaneous. And that sounds magical, and it sounds sales-ish, but it actually is true, uh, and there are many, many many, many cases where you can see it's not just incremental change, but it's fundamental change where the entire business model uh, is astonishingly uh, changed because of, of doing lean. Let's see if I can advance this. There we go. Um, one thing to know is this takes a while. So when you're thinking about embarking on a journey on lean, this is not drive-by <coughs> lean. If you're really going to do lean, this is a, this is a journey that you're on. And what we start with is, up at the top is we start with tools because it needs to be something that you can grab onto. So we commonly talk about tools, but what we want to do is move beyond the tools. We want to get a lot of practice using these tools and thinking about context and using the most important tool in all of the Lean tool set, which is our brain, our critical thinking skills, and saying there's probably technique that will develop over time as we get into a groove, as we start to see how and when to apply these tools in which combinations. So after about two years or so of doing this, you're starting to get into a groove. And what you're doing is by doing, you're starting to transform your belief system. You're starting to transform culture. So this is as much about cultural transformation and people development as it is um, making the improvements itself. And that, that's one of the things I think that the researchers missed in their book. They just looked at the tools, and therefore, a lot of what industry did in the 90s and the aughts and up to now, they're missing the boat because they think it's only about the tools. And so you just I want you to know as leaders uh, that this is about a cultural transformation, and uh, that's, that's, uh, it's going to be a journey of multiple years, and you never stop doing this. You never actually achieve uh, nirvana, but you're getting closer and closer to it as, as you go. So uh, this is a, a book that is a great book from uh, Harvard Business Review Press. It sounds weird, a positive deviance. It sounds like a, a psychology class, but it's really not. It's like, why are some institutions doing phenomenally well and others are not? Well, part of it is, coming back to what I just said, it's actually easier to act your way into a new way of thinking than thinking your way into a new way of acting. So if you're thinking about what might be my first couple of steps into doing lean, it's do it. Dive in. Don't study it. Don't read about it. You know, get a little bit of knowledge about maybe, you know, what would be a good starting point, but you'll learn far more from immersing yourself in this. And so as we work with clients and, uh, you know, around the world in different industries, it's all about immersion. 
and it feels scary at first, but it's like diving into the swimming pool and learning how to swim or learning how to play the piano. You get some instruction, but a lot of it is you've got to practice it, and that's how you'll get the cultural transformation. There's another person I like to quote that says the same thing in a different way. If you remember this, you're probably too young even for this reference now that I think about this, but, uh, but thinking back to Star Wars, uh, in my era, there was Yoda, the little green guy, who said, uh, Luke had said, Luke Skywalker had said, well, I will try. And a lot of institutions say, I'll try lean. And I just think of Yoda when I hear that. Yoda would say, there is no try. There is do or do not. Uh, there is no try. So this is all about you've got to jump in and do this. And uh, Toyota has been after this, uh, doing this, for <laughs> probably since about the 1920s. About 1922, when they were in the loom business, they were in the weaving business. They weren't even in the automobile business yet. And they started picking up principles that apply today. And if you talk to somebody from Toyota, particularly Toyota Japan, and you say, when did you perfect lean? First of all, they, they will say, I don't know what you're talking about, this lean word that you're using, but our methodology, we have not yet perfected it. And they've been at it since 1922. So the only way you do this is to do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, and you get better and better each time you try that. And this is a kind of, kind of another visual of this. Um, we usually say uh, five to ten years, and you will probably then become lean you will probably actually go beyond learning about lean, going beyond drive-by lean, going beyond um, uh, starting to think lean and then becoming that. It gets a little rocky in this period, uh, in this in this time. Why would you suppose that is when you're about three to five years in? Why do you suppose you start to see rockiness where you take one step forward, two steps back? It's very difficult to change people. Yeah, this is about change. <laughs> Early on in this in this era, you're finding low hanging fruit. You're finding something that's pretty easy to change, and it's phenomenally successful, and everybody's excited. So you've cut your ED waiting time in half. Everybody's excited. Okay, now when we go into this realm, we need to take another step forward, and now we're getting into maybe the way uh, nursing does their work fundamentally, or the way physicians do their work fundamentally gets a little tough. Uh, but what you'll notice is these troughs tend to be less low each, to each round you do this. And so what you're doing is you're continually changing. But the thing to know about this, the main, the main purpose for this slide is to know it's a long haul journey. It's not a quick fire kind of a thing. And there will be a time of rockiness, but you've got to get through that. And so many institutions get into that rocky period and they give it up. And it's, it's too bad, because then later they're going to find they have to start all over again. So uh, lean is definitely a journey. But once you get past this, now you've got the new beliefs, you've got the new cultures, and you're in a, mo you're in a different mode of thinking now where uh, we are seeing that we're going to continually improve and we've got a methodology that is in imprinted on and everybody that is, is working for us. Um, I'm going to break this down a little bit, a little bit less philosophical. I want to talk about what we go after and then what are some of the primary tools that we use to go after this? One is uh, waste. That's the, the key topic that uh, we bring up first. There's operational waste, and then there's service design waste. I'll define both of those things, and we'll do an exercise on this. But beyond waste, we're also looking at unevenness. Is there a point in time when um, demand swells, and our processes just amplify that? And so we have a very uneven process that's lumpy? Are we overburdening the people that work in our processes? Those are the kinds of things that Lean looks for and seeks to eliminate. And by doing that, by continually going through cycle after cycle <coughs> of improvement, we're fundamentally changing and improving the care that we provide, but we're also growing everybody's capabilities. So if you can remember one thing from today, it's that Lean is far more than just a set of tools. It's a cultural transformation. So when you get when you become that CEO of a health system, remember that this is your way to cultural transformation. I don't know of any other, and this is the one that is tried and true since the 1920s. Eliminating waste, I say here, it's only part of the battle, but it's a very important first step. So we're going to focus on on what is waste. So to talk about waste, I have to talk about what's the opposite of waste. What's the antimatter of waste, basically? And that would be value add. 
Value add is the thing that is directly, directly uh, fulfilling that customer request. The, th the reason that you are paying somebody to do something, it's the nugget that you're after. And so these pictures are a little bit tricky to see. The middle one is the most fun, so I'll talk about that one. If you go to Disney or if you go to Dollywood, I've heard of a place called Dollywood, uh, but if you go there uh, and you're going to spend the money and you're going to invest the time, you've got very little time to go down there, what are you going there for? To ride the rides, right? So what I'm going to say is that riding the ride is the value. Okay, so that's the nugget that you wanted. Now, if you measure the total lapse time from the time you leave your house to the kind of time you come back to your house, what percent of your time elapsed is spent riding the rides? 0.5%. Right, this much. And the way to think about value as well is it's probably something you wish you had more of. And so if you're like me or my kids or my grandkids now, they want as much ride time as possible. So if you find yourself walking through a process as the customer or the patient, and you're saying, I want more of that, that's probably value added. If it's not value, it's waste. So it's a very binary kind of a thing. If it's waste, I want less of it. I don't want any of it, maybe. So when you stand in line, how much do you appreciate the experience of going to your favorite amusement park and standing in line? You probably want zero of that. So that is the, the reason you're standing in line is the result of process design that they, that they employ. It could include a staffing model design that they've, they've decided to use. But it's based upon the way they've chosen to operate, and it leads to their, you having an experience that contains waste and it contains value. And so what we're trying to do is detect the difference and what we're going to go after is that, that uh, waste point. So uh, this is probably a generous number saying that roughly 10% of any process that you ever touch, roughly 10% is value added. It's usually actually sub 1%. So uh, we find this in healthcare. Uh, commonly, we'll round down to zero, actually. There's just a few points at, in healthcare at which you're actually getting the value. So. Another example is, think about the last time, maybe you've never been to your primary care physician, you guys are so young, but imagine going to a primary care doctor, let's say that you've got an issue, um, you've got a sore throat, you've got an earache, you want to get it checked out, maybe you're going to an urgent care center. Uh, again, think about the time from the time you leave your house to the time you come back. What are you after? What do you want from that visit? What do you want? You want to see the doctor, and the reason you want to see that doctor is you want to get a diagnosis, right? And then you want to get a treatment. So how much time are you spending with the person that's doing the diagnosis and giving you that treatment? Less than five minutes. Yes, less than five minutes out of that entire probably multi-hour wait. If you come into an emergency department anywhere in the land, no matter how good they are, still, you're getting probably 1% of your experiences at value add. So any process, any process at all in industry, it usually is at least 90% non-value added. Now, when you get out and you're starting to actually want to do this in an institution, and let's say it's an institution that's just starting up, mean, and they're not too sure about this whole thing, expect the pushback, particularly in healthcare, to say, uh, I'm not interested in doing this. I don't want to have you re-engineer our processes so my five-minute visit goes to three minutes. And so what you'll say is, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're going to protect the green. We're going to protect the value added. We're going after that whole ugly red part. Look at all the opportunity. And this is a big fundamental part of lean that makes it so different. Without even talking about waste or seeing waste, all we see are the process steps that are documented in a process flow map. And those are usually the value-added pieces we're talking about. So traditional um, attempts to improve a process are going after the green and, and slicing it and slicing it and slicing it. And people are sick and tired of that. And here it's a whole different matter. So we need a whole different set of tools to even see the red. If you don't see the red, if you don't see the waste, you really have no chance. So because look at all that opportunity. This is why you can get breakthrough 
improvements is because there's just so much waste out there in our processes. You can get as good as this, as good as 10% value added, probably after your first couple of years doing lean. The most lean organizations that there are in healthcare, probably Theta Care in Wisconsin is probably as far along as anybody. Virginia Mason out in the uh, state of Washington is about as far along as anybody, and maybe Mayo Clinic behind them. They're probably approaching 50-50. So there's that much work to do, and it's that hard because we're talking about driving change, and it involves people. And people and change don't go together very well. So uh, that's where it gets pretty tricky. So uh, there are categories of waste, and, and you can refer to this sheet. Now you can kind of follow along with me. And, of course, I've done this in a different order than the sheet because I didn't think I had. Uh, so that's a defect right there. But uh, there are eight categories of waste. And I want uh, to have you uh, kind of walk through with me as we go through these definitions. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. And I'd like you... Uh, to think about with whoever you're sitting near. If you're not sitting near anybody, you can either partner up with somebody or just work independently. But I'm going to have you think about your experience in a restaurant because we all experience restaurants. We don't all experience surgery. We don't all experience wound care clinics, whatever. So we all experience restaurants. But let me go through the healthcare examples in just a second. Here. Uh, all right, transport. Let's talk about transport waste first. This is where you're moving a patient through the process. You're either ambulating them with a, a wheelchair, a stretcher, etc., from place to place to place, or they are ambulating from place to place to place. And the reason that this is a category of waste is uh, usually everybody is seeking diagnosis and treatment. That's what we're seeking, or maybe some counseling. In a way, that's, that's treatment as well. We're seeking that moment where we're with a provider of some sort getting, getting either a diagnosis or a treatment. Everything else is, is going to be waste. So as we're having somebody walk up to an area in a building and register, and then we're instructing them to go sit down over there, and then we're instructing them when called, now walk over here to the other side of that building, none of that walking time is, is adding any value because we're not getting them diagnosed or treated in that time. So either we're moving the patient or uh, the patient is ambulating from place to place. And it is amazing once you start watching for this, how much we're asking patients to move from place to place. That's transport waste. Um, inventory is, uh, in itself, is just a neutral term, but it can be waste when we have either, uh, we're out of something critical that causes the process to halt. So let's say that you're coming in to get um, a particular treatment and the meds that we need to give you, uh, they're not where we thought they were. And so now I've got to go into hunting and gathering mode, and off I go. And meanwhile, the process has stopped from the point of view of that patient, and it's not attractive. It's not, it's not value uh, when you're seeking that out. So if you're short of something, you've run out, you've got to find it. That's, that's a bad thing from an inventory standpoint. The second type of waste is where you have more of something than you need, or you have stuff you don't need, but it's in your work area, and it tends to occupy space tends to clutter, tends to cause you to not be able to process as efficiently as you possibly can because there's too much stuff. Some of you are thinking about your garage right now. But you may be thinking about stuff that I've got to get what I need. I've got to paw through a bunch of things, find the item I need, and that's unnecessary. So in the work area, we try to figure out uh, what we can do about those situations, mainly so the process can run smoothly without, without delay. Uh, motion. Motion is... For the people that are working in the process, we want to see what's their walking pattern. Are they having to flip all over the place, or are they able to undertake a particular job without a lot of traffic? As there's motion, by definition, as you are moving as the worker, we're not caring for that patient, if you're the person that's assigned to care for that patient. If you're scurrying around looking for things, for example, that's not helpful. If you're having to search for things while that patient is waiting, that's not helpful. There can be virtual motion as well as physical motion, too. Uh, think about the last time you were looking for um, a particular document in your computer, and it's something that you used last semester or the year before, and are you having to go through, I think it's here, click, 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 click. Nope, it must be here. It must be in this jump drive. It must be somewhere. That's all kind of virtual motion. While you're finding this thing that you need in order to provide care for that patient, 
Um, that's just delay. So that's waste as well. Um, waiting is the most obvious. In healthcare, we actually have rooms dedicated to waiting. We have waiting rooms. In no other industry do we have rooms dedicated to nothing happening. And so it's kind of, it's kind of telling right there. And we're usually saying we need to expand our waiting room. We don't have a big enough waiting room. And that's, that's an indication where we're not thinking lean. Instead of let's fix our process, that's let's, let's add more buildings, let's add more space to create more waiting. Uh, but waiting, usually we're waiting on something. We're waiting on an approval. We're waiting on a physician. We're waiting on a test result. We're waiting on, sometimes we're waiting on the patient, but we're waiting on something. The process has come to a halt. Um, overproduction. And overproduction and overprocessing sound the same, but they're completely different things. Overproduction is where, uh, let's say that I'm an upstream part of the process, and I am going to basically send work to the next part of the process. And let's say that I decide I'm going to batch, which means that I'm going to hold things until I get several things, and then it's efficient for me to walk this over to you. But now I'm going to unleash this on the front row. Bam, here's a stack of work. All of a sudden, they've gone from an idle state to busier than they can possibly be. I've given them more work than they can undertake at, at, a, at a particular point in time. Where does this happen in healthcare? Everywhere. Okay, <laughs> everywhere. Because people, again, are thinking islands of suboptimization, or islands of optimization. A physician, for example, will say, I'm going to carry around the physical chart on all the patients that I'm going to see in the next 10 minutes because I don't have time to give that chart to the next person who needs that, where they still use paper charts, which is a lot of places. But so they'll carry with them, even though they're done with half of these, they'll carry around several of these before handing that off to the next patient. Or in lab, laboratory medicine, it may be that your particular patient you're going to get a, a culture done of a particular wound. You're going to get that swab. They're going to create a culture of that. You're going to put that in an incubator for a few days and see what grows and figure out what antibiotic you need. Guaranteed that is batched because to the people that are doing that part of the process, it's way more efficient for me to wait until there are 20 vials there and I'll do all 20, get them all into the incubator at the same time, and I'll report all those out at the same time. So everywhere there's batching. It's called overproduction because think about when they're done with their piece, boom, I'm, I'm landing that on the next person downstream, and it's more than that person can handle. And that's where we're losing first in, first out order. We're actually lose, sometimes losing things, losing specimens sometimes, losing a chart, etc., because it's more than we need to do. It's not an efficient flow. So that's overproduction. Overprocessing is completely different, and this is where we're just doing something that's completely not necessary at all. And once you start looking for this in a process, you'd be amazed at how much of this you see. So here's an example I think we can all relate to. 1-800 uh, number, you're calling somebody like a credit card company or a bank or whatever. Have you talked to somebody or you try to talk to somebody on a 1-800 number? What happens is you never get a human being anymore, right? So... I think everybody uses the same message. I swear, it's the same voice, no matter who you're calling. And it goes like this. Your call is very important to us. <laughs> right? Uh, in order to provide the best possible service, please give us your name and your account number. <laughs> and then you're on music. And then a human being comes on minutes later. What are the first two questions that they ask you? Your, your name and your account number. And I always say, you already have that information. Completely redundant. That's over-processing at that point. They say, I'm talking to a nerd. Um, but that is, that's an example. Do we do this in healthcare? Absolutely. Absolutely. A group I'm working with this week, uh, just across the street, we're working in an outpatient clinic. And this is the nature of this is the patient comes back in for multiple treatments about every week. And we re-register patients every week. Fill out this form. But you know me. I'm Jenny from the block. <laughs> and you know me. I just came into my mind. I don't know why. But you know me. You've got me in your system. But I know, but that's our process. We need to re-register you because that's the way, because that's the way we bill. So here now we're optimizing for the way we bill rather than optimizing for what's best for the patient. So that's over processing. Another example of that is just doing things that you just don't need to do. If your physician can get you the information you need for a diagnosis with a $5 test, 
that is a blood stick and can be done right at the, at the bedside. But they're insisting that uh, I need to order a thousand dollar test. It's going to take two weeks to come back because it's ultra precise. That's way more than is needed. And that goes on all the time. Uh, at Mayo Clinic, when I started working in the radiology area, we commonly would have people coming from all over the place to come to Mayo Clinic up in Minnesota. And they had certain processes for getting your imaging together, getting your x-rays, getting your MRIs from where you live, get that together, bundle it up, send it into Mayo Clinic. And as I was following patients through this process, the first thing that would happen is they'd arrive at Mayo Clinic and the physician would say, I'm going to order an MRI, I'm going to order this and order that. And I, as, as the dumb engineer, I just said, why? They just provided this. Well, you know, I don't know who read that. I don't really trust that. So we're going to order it all over again. <clears throat> and by the way, that's an impact on, you know, insurance. Yeah. It's an impact on the people because they have to go through that. And it's daunting, particularly for people that are coming to Mayo who are gravely, gravely ill having to go through that. So that's another example of overprocessing. Um, defects is another category. This basically is anything that didn't come out the way you expected it to come out. And it can be deadly. It can be, I'm sorry, Ron, we did the wrong surgery on you. We took out your good kidney. I'm sorry about that, but we have a coupon for you know 10% off next time you come in. And so it can be deadly. We can harm people, we can kill people, uh, or we can irritate people. Anything within that spectrum. But it's where there's either human error that happens that causes us to do the wrong thing. If we detect it, if we're lucky enough to detect it, at least what we're doing is the rework of that, which chews up capacity in your process. At the very least, it's, a, it's an organizational operational issue. But at the most, you know, again, we can do harm. So defect is just any time where something has gone amiss due to either human error or machine drift. Sometimes that'll happen in laboratory settings. Sometimes that'll happen in radiology settings. Um, and then the last one is unused human potential. And this is where either we have you doing a job that either you are overqualified for or underqualified for. If you're overqualified qualified for it, the, the issue with that is that we're, we probably have other things that you are qualified to do that we're getting slammed on. We should have you floating to right job, right person, right role. And if we're not looking at that in our staffing model, we've got the wrong people doing that. And an example of that um, in healthcare commonly is this. Um, occasionally you'll have a behavioral health patient down in the emergency department or somewhere else that needs to be watched. Just, just somebody in the room. Doesn't require a clinical background, doesn't require any specific um, advanced degree or anything like that. And commonly what happens is we're using our highest level RNs to do that. Just because uh, you go do that. If we're not thinking through the ramifications of that. And meanwhile, we're getting slammed in a critical care unit because we don't have enough critical care nurses. So that's an example of where it's just the wrong person, wrong job. Another example of uh, unused human potential is um, there's more that you can do. You, there's more that you can bring to the table than we're asking of you. And the whole lean journey opens up an avenue to let people's brains be put to use who know the process best, and commonly at places that aren't doing lean, it's managers, VPs, CEOs that are making all the decisions and not using the potential that somebody has who knows the work the best. So those are some examples. I feel like I've blabbed on and on and on. Um, let's just quickly think through, just take some notes on, think about a restaurant experience that you've had and uh, try to see which of, which of these you can come up with in just a couple of minutes. Pick one or two and see if in your experience at a restaurant do you see any of these things going on. So just take a couple minutes. Hey, by the way, um, okay, good. All right.
All right, 30 more seconds on this. All right, we're going to get started. I, I wish we could take more time on this, but we've just got a limited time. Who has just a phenomenal example of one of these kinds of waste in a restaurant setting? And if you've got one, why don't you stand up and just speak out loudly, because I don't know where the microphones are. But, uh, if you've got a great example, feel free. Who, who has a mediocre example? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we got one for overproduction. Uh-huh. It's like an olive garden. They've already got the salads and breadsticks made, and they're bringing out breadsticks that are cold. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they, and they probably thought it's awesome to work right. ahead, right? But then it's cold. Yeah, it doesn't meet the requirements. Good. <laughs> a good example. Um, I think obviously waiting on your drinks or waiting on a mm -hmm. table, waiting on your food, yep. can be extended more than necessary. Sometimes. Right, right. What else? That's a good example. <laughs> Yes. When you have drinks that are empty and the there's somebody like a hostess that's standing there, but it, that's not part of their job. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's a great example of unused human potential. They're there, but it's not their job to help you out. Yeah, great examples. Let's take uh, two more. Yes. Um, for unused human potential, um, I said sometimes we have like our best servers food running and our worst servers out there serving. Uh-huh. Yeah, very good. Very good. One more. You have items out of stock, but they're still on the menu, and it causes people to have to reorder. Very good. That happens a lot, doesn't it? And it's irritating because you've taken the time to kind of winnow down, winnow down, and now you got your taste buds just set. you got to be kidding me. You're out of that? Really? Yeah. And it's probably because of poor planning, poor processes. So um, my hope is that... You can learn to see the waste. And so the homework assignment, and I don't know when I'll ever see you again, but the homework assignment that goes forever is this. I want you to take that list. I want you to, um, any process you find yourself in, uh, particularly you know, restaurants, uh, going to get your car fixed, certainly any healthcare experiences, I want you to practice seeing the waste. Okay, And it'll absolutely drive you nuts. If you if you get to the point of seeing waste and really understanding what waste is versus the little bits of time that are truly value, you can't ever go back. And that's really the first step. You've got to learn to see uh, in order to do this. And then, then it'll be easier to apply these concepts to the processes that you find yourself working in or directing someday. So you've got to learn to see. The, I've, I have many slides that I'm not going to be able to get through, but presumably they'll be posted for you so you'll be able to look through a lot of tools this is just an example of one of many, many different things that we do to visualize current state of a process. We've got to, first of all, see where the waste is. This is called a spaghetti diagram because it looks like cooked spaghetti that you just throw onto a wall. But this is actually following um, workers in a process going around. This is a Mayo Clinic slide, I think. Yeah, this is in a particular uh, work area. 
and look at what they need to do to just undertake the work for one patient. That much moving around, huge delays. And all this waste is just a symptom. It's, it's just a high level. We need to drill down and understand why is that. We need to ask ourselves why, which I, which I did in this case. And we found out that there was no good reason for this. But there was certain equipment, certain work areas that just happened to be available in corners of this area. And so that's usually how processes kind of come together. They're not engineered well. They just sort of happen, and then they sort of be codified, and they're usually awful. So uh, this is the waste of motion as a, as a way of looking at this. Um, in the little bit of time I have left, I want to tell you about some of the key constructs within Lean. There are many tools, but uh, one of the key things is that's quite different from other uh, improvement work that you may have been exposed to is we use rapid improvement events. Um, sometimes they're called Kaizen bursts or Kaizen blitzes. And Kaizen just means improvement for the good in, in Japanese. But basically the notion is you have small empowered teams and it's composed mostly of frontline staff. So this is already uh, freaks people out in healthcare because healthcare improvement traditionally over the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s has been very tops down, very you know director, VP, I know what the answer is, just go implement this. And it's usually a disaster. <coughs> This flips, this inverts the pyramid, and it says the people who are closest to the work have the best insights about what the issues are, and probably have fairly good insights about what we can do differently to make that better. Um, we usually laser focus them on a particular aspect of the entire value stream. The value stream is that whole set of tasks and delays between tasks from the customer requesting something to the time that it's fulfilled. So if you came in for surgery, um, and it didn't involve a hospitalization, for example, this would act, the value stream would actually begin at the time that you're in your surgeon's office at a consult where they're describing what this is, what the risks are, et cetera. And then we would map every step of your journey from the patient's perspective until you are dismissed home, maybe into physical therapy. So it's all of that stuff. And what we do with each team then is we focus them on one particular aspect but always in the context of this entire value stream. And we're usually tackling waste. So we'll find waste uh, with a particular aspect of this, like the re-registration, success of re-registration. We would take a team and say, we need to figure out a way to get all that waste out. Let's find a way to do that differently. It's a very data-driven methodology. I think uh, this can help appeal to uh, clinicians because they're scientists. Engineers are, uh, are like it too because it's very data-driven with very specific measures, and we do root cause analysis. Uh, so a key term besides seeing waste uh, is, is the five whys. You may have been exposed to this at some point, but it's basically taking a problem that's a surface level issue and breaking it down. Why does that happen? And okay, now why do those things happen? And kind of drilling that down and then going into rapid cycle experimentation. And it's kind of fun actually. So in the course of about four days, we actually um, start from here's the problem to be solved, and at the end of those four days, we've experimented seven ways to Sunday, basically, on what are the different ways we can make an impact on that, and we got it in the groove by the end of that fourth day. Uh, so if you find yourself um, in an institution that's doing committee work one hour per month, you're meeting and ramping up for the first half hour and ramping down for the second half hour, it is agonizing you're not doing lean. This is, this is the way to make breakthrough change quickly. Very highly concentrated effort. This is an example. We're not going to read through this, but this is what root cause analysis looks like. And you start, you're not expected to read this, but this is from Mission, actually. Um, when I was there, we had a patient safety issue. Oops, we gave somebody the wrong dose of a drug at the wrong time. Other than that, everything was great. But and unfortunately, it was chemo, so it's kind of a big deal. So high-level problem, why is that? Why did that happen? Why did that happen? Why, 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 why? And this is just to illustrate that when you get below the surface, it's kind of like an iceberg. There's way more than meets the eye to these problems. And so you systematically drill down why, why, why. And the little triangles here are the changes to the process that we made. If you're dealing at the high level and you're saying problem, solution, bam, bam, it's that fast you're probably not doing a very good job of solving that problem. So you may have experienced where we've tended to try to solve a problem 
only to have it come back and back and back. We're revisiting these same issues. You want to do a structured root cause analysis because look at all the changes that really, truly were required to really make sure that we never, ever have this issue happen again. And that's a key, key component to, to lean is, is doing good root cause analysis. And then uh, once we figure out what the issues are, figuring out what the changes are that we want to do, then we try experimentation, um, IHI, uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement out in Boston has driven this for a very long time. Small tests of change, they call it. So start small. Start over here. You've got an idea. Don't just say, great, this is the way we're going to do it. Test it. Test it with the next patient. Test it with a provider. Test it with uh, the next for the next hour. And what we're going to do is plan it. We're going to do the experiment. We're going to check it to see if it met the, re the requirements, met the measures that we had for it. And then we will adjust. That's the PDCA cycle. It's embedded component of lean as well. We want to start small and then expect there to be some difficulties, but we're going to adjust. We're going to run a second experiment on a little bit bigger scale as we learn. And over the course of our uh, the usual Kaizen Blitz or the usual rapid improvement event, we'll probably do six or seven successive cycles of experimentation. By the time that you're done with six or seven of these cycles, you've got a pretty solid grasp of this thing, if this is going to work or not. Far better than the tops down, like, here's what we're going to do, because there's probably just a surface level understanding of the problem. So these are core pieces of, of what lean is. And now I'm going to flip way ahead, not, maybe not way ahead. <laughs> I've got a couple of things I want to kind of close with, and then we'll have time for question and discussion. So if this is so awesome, why is, why is everybody not doing this successfully? What's the issue? Um, and here are the leading things. This is my opinion of what I've seen over the course of, of my time doing this, about 30-some years, is the first thing is if leadership doesn't feel an urgency to change from the status quo, then you're going to be swimming upstream with whatever you try to do. So it's very key that this be, uh, we've got somebody who's championing this at as high a level as possible to say, we can't have this. We can't have what we're doing right now. And this is sometimes referred to as the burning platform. The house is on fire. We have to get out. Um, we're losing money. We have to change. We're losing market share. We have to change. We're harming people. We have to change. We have to find that reason to say, we can't live where we are at right now. A lot of uh, health care reform is going on. I think you're getting a lot of that in your, in your curriculum right now. That is causing there to be a burning platform for every institution in the land, which I'm delighted to see. It's more of a pay for performance than pay just because you showed up for work. It's you've got to do good job. You've got to do a good job. You've got to have high quality, and you've got to you've got to be better than everybody. So now that everybody's incented to be in the top decile on every measure in the land, awesome. Now you start you're starting to get a burning platform. But even then, uh, there are some institutions that just still don't see uh, the urgency to change. You've got to have that. Some people believe that, well, we kind of do the committee method, and it seems to be working for us over the last four years just fine. You've got to get over that as well. Or we've not created you know, a shared vision for this. We don't care about driving culture. We're not bought into um, actually having the people closest to the work involved. Those are some barriers. Now, I'm bringing this up because you are going to be leaders. You're going to one day be in a position of authority and look at how much leadership is the issue here. Uh, you can make or break these. So if you want to see places that are doing this well, uh, what you'll find is leaders at every level of leadership from CEO on down are bought in. Were they there on day one? No. It's a journey. But you've got to have that. If you, if, if you start to lose that, it's going to be tough. And then the last one is, you know, sometimes we have wonderful gains, but they're just not sustained because it's change. We're, in, we're, we're, we're introducing change to people. And they may bucket over time. So the methodology, though, knows that these things are going to happen and will work with groups. And, and the lean methodology alone will, will make sure that we can overcome a lot of this. But it's hard. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, I wanted to just bust a few myths about healthcare. You'll run into this if you're doing lean in healthcare. Uh, we'll hear the providers won't have time for this. They won't buy in. And by provider, I'm, I'm kind of generalizing. It's usually physician, physician. Um, nurse practitioner, PA, whatever, whatever the provider is. And the fact is they will, but don't expect people who are scientists to go on the basis of opinion or emotion. They're going to want data. This is a data-driven methodology. Um, the methodology that we employ as we go through the four-day exercise is the scientific method. We form hypotheses. 
We test hypotheses, we prove hypotheses, we adjust, and it's all very data-driven, heavily measurement-oriented, so providers do buy in. Um, I ran into this when I came to Mayo Clinic for the first time, fresh out of technology, first into healthcare, and it's a physician-driven organization. So everything is done with a physician there, and they did buy in once they saw it was data-driven, it was a scientific method. Um, I heard early on also that uh, people are not cars, and so they're getting glommed on to too much of the Toyota thing. Um, yeah, truly, people are not cars. Sadly, the state of healthcare is such that our cars are treated much more carefully today than our patients are. So I agree with that statement. People are not cars. It's a shame we don't treat them as well as cars. So that's what we've got to do. So uh, the point is this methodology does work. Um, a lot of people will say, well, we in... We in clinical, or we in critical care, we're different, so this doesn't apply to us. Or we in outpatient services, we're different because it doesn't apply to us. Or we in the emergency department, are different. You don't understand, we're different. Everybody says that in every industry. It doesn't matter because we break it down into process, we break it down into waste, imbalance, variation, etc., and we go after it. Some people will say we can't predict demand. Yes, you can. It's data driven. If you're an emergency department and you say, I don't know, I can't control who will come in the front door, I know you can't control it, but there are patterns. And so it's, again, very data-driven. We're too regular to be able to change. So are nuclear power plants, and they have changed. Healthcare is changing, and you can change. In fact, we partnered at Mission Health, which is fairly small compared to a Mayo Clinic. We actually partnered with um, CMS and Joint Commission to say, we have a better way. Your regulation is holding us back. Would you listen to this, look at our data? And they changed the regulations and joint commission changed the, the way that they came in and looked at that. So they, they're they hungry for somebody to have the critical thinking and push back. So what can you do right now? I think I'm going to end with this slide and over time a little bit. So first thing is learn to see. That's the homework assignment. Learn to see. Anytime that you're out and about, uh, either at work or at play, think about, just observe, um, where is their waste? And where? why am I here? Where's the Where's the value? You'll see the waste. You'll see the imbalance. You'll see the over, uh, overburden. If you can learn to see it, then you can't get it off you. You just can't help it. You're starting to become a lean thinker. The next thing is to become a lean doer. And how can you do that? There are probably opportunities everywhere. Uh, there are probably opportunities to join a rapid improvement event, reach out to institutions in the area. Uh, Mountain States is doing it. Uh, and across the whole system. And uh, there, I understand there's a merger, so that just opens up more avenues. There are going to be lots and lots of rapid improvement events. you got to just dive in and do it so you can learn it. It's not something you read textbooks about. Or let's say that you're in an institution, such as the one you're in right now, um, say, hey, we've got a chronic issue with X. Let's propose that we try doing lean here. Great. Uh, propose it and lead it. And if it is awful, that's fine. You're learning, you're learning, you're trying these things. Seek out someone with an experience as well. Um, it usually helps to have somebody be able to advise you as you go to set up for success, to execute for success, and to sustain following that. So seek out somebody, and there are a number of people. Don't worry about if it, that person's from a different industry because these tools apply all over the place. And then practice some of these basic tools. Um, when you're a leader, uh, this is, these are things that you're going to forget, but I'm going to hopefully uh, hopefully some of this will stick. As a leader, I want you to make sure that you're always going out and seeing. Don't manage the organization from your desk. Go out and see. Watch the process. Watch the process as though you were a customer. Okay, it's sort of like the Secret Boss TV show. Actually, go out there and see how this is actually being done from the perspective of the patients or customers or whatever and then tap into the people that are closest to the work. And I think I'll stop at that point and see if uh, we want to have any questions or discussion about any particular aspect of, of lean in healthcare. Sorry if this was so rushed, but I want to end on time. Yes? Um, I'm Kristen Minnick. I'm with the health department here in Northeast Tennessee and Cindy Saylor is here with me as well. And we are actually just starting to implement the lean process improvement thinking. Um, as, even as early as this year, mm -hmm. we've done a couple of 5S events at some of our local health departments, and we've had students go with us too. So we have a calendar of lean events nice. that we have coming up, and any student who's interested, we welcome them to observe and 
jump in and help us with anything. We have our academic health department coordinator here, Shane Timberlake, and he's working with us to connect students with us to do these events. So that's an opportunity for students as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. Any questions? I guess I had a question. Mm -hmm. That is silly. Has LEAD been tried at educational institutions? Yes. And, and if so, with what levels of success? Huge success. Um, in Canada, interestingly, I don't know why. Maybe because the government, maybe the government owns a lot of the you know universities, but tremendous success at uh, Canadian universities. Um, and the reason I know that is because some of my colleagues have actually chosen to take me into uh, higher education. So, and uh, if you think about break down the processes of just about everything, curriculum development, um, executing curriculum, registering students. If you think about from a student perspective, some of the, some of the processes that students go through are awful. And so uh, they'll actually engage students in that process and learn together. And it's, yeah, it's, it's been wonderful. So I guess I'm just, I'm just curious, and this is a self-serving you know, serving question. Like in an academic setting, there's a very interesting organization and power structure mm -hmm. where we as academic departments are responsible for um, the academic programs and, and the quality of the academic programming. Mm -hmm. But all of those student processes are pretty much outside the academic mm -hmm. department unit, mm -hmm. you know, at one centralized office or another. Mm -hmm. So, and this is, this is a discussion for another day, but I'm just interested in how that would work, yeah. you know, given that, I guess, there are silos, in a way, uh, right. across the organization. There, there are two things that occur to me. One is, um, I, if there's an interest locally, as within a school, I would tackle something that you do have control over. Mm -hmm. So you do have control over certain aspects and start there, but then uh, start to work um, upward to the people that do own those more um, corporate, if you will, kinds of processes. And usually we'll find that there, there are seeds of interest, and if they're aware that, hey, we're starting to do lean at a local level, they'll start to be interested and maybe uh, you'll get the chance to tackle the larger, the larger processes. And the nature of this, by the way, is... <clears throat> You um, start with something and major breakthroughs, major breakthroughs, and it gets interest, and you start to light a fire. So you're striking a match, lighting a little fire, and then the fire grows, the fire grows, the fire grows, and it gets the attention, finally, of, of the, the top-level uh, leadership. So start small, start local, if you don't already have top-level uh, pull for this. Any other questions? If you have any, um, I'll hang around for a few minutes, and uh, I've got my card here too, so you can always text me or email me questions uh, now or going into the future. I'm always, always available. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I, I don't know about you guys, but uh, and I've listened to lots of few presentations, but this certainly has been one of the best in providing the overall context and really linking all of those tools into the overall picture. So it, it, so it has helped me a lot. Good. And, and it has caused me to do a lot of thinking, you know, why, why we are talking. Mm -hmm. So we really, really appreciate it. And oh, just a small, uh, again, token of appreciation. Oh, thank, you. Uh, thank you again. Thank you again. April 28th for our last breakfast with the experts for this uh, semester. Not the first Tuesday in May, because that's finals week. Okay, April 28th. See you guys and have a great day. Well, I was going to say, I had your class, but I don't want to go to the class.